morning. I, I tell you what, you know, I, I prayed this prayer with the first service. I'm going to pray with you too, just because, man, I tell you what, I don't know. When we go do things like 40 people raising their hand for salvation and, and the outreach that's going on in this church, I don't know how your life gets, but my life seems to get a little bit more difficult. Like, everything I do seems to take one extra step, like the internet's out or the things are done or everything just seems to go one step at a time. The microphone doesn't work. The the things don't happen, you know what I mean? So I've been praying this prayer internally, and I'm going to pray it with you as a church because I know you're part of the church, so you're doing it too. So if the enemy's after me, he's after you too. But you know what? We serve a God who's bigger than him. Amen? And we are able to pray and just ask God, and we can, we can rebuke this fool in a second. Amen? And sometimes we just need to take control of our circumstances. So let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father... We come against the enemy in all forms and fashions and ways, Lord. Lord, he, he is not allowed to torment your people. Lord, he has to go. Lord, we ask that you would just um, put a hedge around us, um, fortify us, Lord. But more than that, Lord, just take the enemy and cast him away. Yes. as far from our life, Lord. We pray that you would just begin to, Lord, I know that we're, we're putting your name out there, and I know you're supporting that in every way. Lord, I just ask that you would just be our shield and stay in this moment. Help us to, to walk in you without hindrance today. Lord, and tell that enemy, Lord, we tell that enemy, he has to go in the name of Jesus. Our God is bigger than him, and he is not allowed to put a hand on your anointed. Lord, and we thank you for that. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. God is good. Hey, um, last thing, this isn't my notes, that one wasn't, this isn't my notes, but I, I told you last week and I'll tell you again until we get there, the church's voice needs to be heard, all right? So vote. Can you do that, right? I don't need you to, look, I don't need to tell you how to vote or what to do, I just want you to vote your values, but if the church's voice could be heard in all the elections in the United States of America, I bet you we'd live in a different country, amen? Amen. So I would just say, let's not be shy about it. This is a great time for you to exercise the freedoms we have in this country and go and place a vote, okay? Can you do that? There are other things on the ballot, not just a crazy presidential election, but there are local and state officials who are very supportive of our church and different things in the area, as well as there's some veteran issues that are on there and some bond issues, but just pray that for, for our country. But while you're doing that, cast a vote. Let the church's voice be heard. Amen? All right. Thank you so much. All right, so we are continuing in our boundary series, and if you don't have the book yet, you haven't been listening. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Dr. Henry Cloud, Dr. John Townsend, it's a great book. Um, it's instrumental in my life. It's very changing. Many of you have already gone through the book since we started this series. We're just covering one chapter of this book in this entire series, and so it's a, it's a good guide. Um, concepts of the boundaries that we need just to make sure, just in case you're new to this process, right? Our concepts are this. One, God created boundaries. Genesis 1, he told where, where us to live, where the fish to live, where the birds to live. He gave us dominion and, and things in our area, right? And he created boundaries. We can't live in water. They can't live outside of water, right? This is not how this works. We all have our domains where we are built to be multiply and be fruitful and to grow and to do the right things. And so we also get to tell things in our lives where they can grow, where they can't grow, where they can do, because we have dominion over our lives and so we need to exercise that, okay? The second thing is when you set a boundary, both sides are going to be upset every time. If you're setting a healthy boundary, it's almost like the guideline, right? If you're setting a good boundary, then they're probably going to be mad because they don't get to treat you the way that they used to. And you're probably going to be mad because you've been a fool for a little bit now and, you don't, and you're feeling that, right? So you have to be like, nope, I don't want to do that anymore, but I also don't want to continue down this lane. So we're going to set the boundary Anyway, last week we talked about being proactive, not just having the reactive moment, but being proactive. We're going to go ahead and set the boundary, even if it upsets them, even if it doesn't, because it's the healthy thing to do. And the third thing is boundaries are fences, not walls. We're not building walls. Walls keep things on the other side. That's their whole intent, is to keep everything else separated. We're building fences, fences that you can see through, that you can see over, sometimes a four-foot fence, sometimes a wrought iron fence. It's about the neighborly relationship. Love your neighbor. Someone said that. I think Jesus, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. So we're supposed to be in those relationships, and that's what a healthy relationship looks like. So we're building fences, not walls, all right? So these are the three things that we have, just kind of overarching concepts. 
for how we're handling boundaries um, as a church, all right? So today we are in the eighth law of boundaries. <clears throat> and these are laws, not just laws that things that we like or that we think are good things, but there are God's laws for the world, really. We're just learning them, right? We got, God, God's world operates this way and has forever, but we have not adapted it to our personal life because we just don't know. We learned a different law, we learned a different way, and now we're adapting them. And so as we learn, today we're on the eighth one, and this one is called envy, right? Which is, it's kind of an interesting law, but it's more of a fact of life, like envy. This is what we do. Let's read in James chapter 4, verse 2. It says this, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. James talk, talk, is talking about a threat to Christianity. There's a threat to Christianity out there, and he says it's your covetingness and your envy that's a threat. But it's not an external threat, right? It's not even something that's on the other side of the fence. Envy and covetousness is not an external threat. It's an internal threat. You desire, but you can't have it, so you kill. You covet, but, you, but it doesn't happen, so you quarrel and fight. You break relationships when we give over to envy and covetedness. Covet means this, right? It's kind of a, a Bible word. Not many people use it, but covet just means this, to yearn or possess or have. Like, think of it, covet is grabbiness, right? You don't just see it, but you grab and bring to you. Okay, you're, you're wanting it to be that. You're, you're standing there. Now, we deal with this mildly, and we just deal with it every day, and it's called comparison, right? You know, you get on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, and, and, and you look at their family, and it's just so nice, and everything's so good, and all their, all their clothes match, and there's not a stain on them, and their, and their hair is in the right place, and, and that yellow bow was just perfect. Like, who thought of the yellow bow, right? You know, and then you look at their family, and maybe even last night, someone went to our pumpkin patch and sat down and took the perfect family picture, posted it on Instagram, tagged it in D1. That's why you've already seen it, right? And so you spent five minutes this morning thinking about, how did they get their kids there? My kids were wearing pajama pants, you know? And you're like, what is going on here? I didn't even think that long. I was there for the candy, not for that. These people were there for the gram, you know? And it was like all this thing. How did... And so we live in this comparison, and social media makes it really easy for us to compare our lives with people that don't live our lives all the time, right? And we live in this way where we're constantly trying to live up to something that's unattainable or live up to something that, that, and some people are so good at it, the ones that we really like to look, those guys are so good at staging their photos that someone pays them to be in your feed, right? They pay them to, to make sure that they get prime spaces in your feed so they make you feel that way so that you go out and buy the products they use or do the things that they, they, they support, right? So, this is constant in our lives. We don't open up our phones without looking at someone else's picture or walking down this, this lane or going in this way. But the problem with this line of thinking is that we're never going to live up to those moments. Even if you bought all the same clothes, put the right yellow bow on there, did all the right stuff, even if you did that, you know why you're never going to live up? Because you know your life. And that picture doesn't carry your life because you still got all kinds of issues going on behind that picture and you know what they all are. So even if you did all of this stuff right, we're never going to reach that level of comparison. Comparison's a killer. We're never going to get there, right? We have to do it only in light of our own life. Now, I know comparison to some of you just seems harmless. It's good to look at the pictures, and it's okay to strive for different things, and it's good, and we can really scent that, but I, I, wanna, I want you to capture James' point in this moment. So let me tell you a story about Adam and Eve, right? Because envy is not, the, envy is not just one of the sins that's out there. It's the first sin. Adam and Eve were living in a garden with God, happy, they were hungry, they had food, they were, they were thirsty, they had drink. Whatever they needed was supplied for them and given to them. They breathed the perfect air, they drank the best water, they did everything they could do. And one day a serpent comes along and he doesn't bring an apple and be like, you know you're hungry for an apple. He says, he says oh, but if you eat this, you can be like God. 
Even in their life, they had a comparison. The only other person they knew was God. And they compared themselves to him. He couldn't compare them to the animals because God already told them they were beneath them. He said, look at God. Don't you want to be like that? And if you do this, you can be like him. Envy and covetousness is the first sin. So it's not harmful comparison. It's not, it's not okay yearnings in us, right? When we shade it as we're going to go get it, he says, if you really envy, you're gonna, you, you, you'll kill for it. You'll at least quarrel and fight for it, right? And, and the thing we learn in the garden is that envy is actually a relationship breaker. Envy broke the relationship between Adam and Eve and God. Envy broke the relationship between God and man. Right? So we're building our fence to build healthy relationships. We cannot envy because envy is a relationship breaker. So if we built all these things up and then we get to envy, but we fail to put that plank in our fence, right? We're breaking relationship at that point. No matter how healthy it was, no matter how great it is, no matter how Garden of Eden-esque it is, we break it when we go to envy and covetousness, all right? Matter of fact, God knew so much that he put it in the Ten Commandments again, right? There's the Ten Commandments. You know what it says, number 10? Do not covet. Real simple, right? Don't do it. Just don't do it. Don't be thinking that way because it's harmful to our relationships. Remember, Ten Commandments are about relationships. Sermon on the Mount's about relationships. Boundaries, about relationships. This Bible, about relationships. All right? That's why it's highlighted over and over and over again. So look, whether we're desiring physical things or different relationships or other people's relationships, we are in dangerous territory. There's no simple sin, right? E Eve did not think it was just something simple, right? She might have, but it, where, look where it led, right? When we give in to that desire and that emotion, we, we step out. Galatians 6.4 said this, each one of us should test their own actions, then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. So Paul, he wants to encourage us how to handle this envious nature that's in all of us, right, from the beginning of time. He says, look, this is what you do. Stop looking out and start looking in. Start looking in. He says, stop looking out at others and start looking in. He even says we can take pride in our accomplishments. We can look at the things in our life and we can start listing our blessings. We can be blessed to be a blessing. We can start looking at our blessings and saying, okay, we've done good enough to get here, right? We are okay. We have breath in our lungs. We made it to 8 a.m. service, right? We did good, or we made it to 9.30 service. We did good, right? No, you guys didn't make it to 8 a.m. I can't take pride in that one, 9.30, all right? But look, he even takes it a little further. says we can be proud of the life that we've built with God in it, with, a, with our world. We can take a little bit of pride in what we're doing. Look, so you just tell yourself, you made it, good job right? You got that job, right? Whatever job you have, you got it, right? You, you have beautiful children, right? You're, you have breath in your lungs. You paid that bill. You never thought you'd pay your car off ever, right? You did it, right? We can take a moment and look at our life instead of looking out at others and start checking off what's good about what we have in our own yard, Right? Remember, we're supposed to look in our yard, and that's the gratitude. That's our motivation for going out, right? Is in our own yard. Sometimes when you start feeling these feelings, Paul says, start looking in. Start looking at what you already have. Start counting your blessings. Start seeing what you have. I had this opportunity one time when I was working in the corporate world, and we, we got to go to Vegas. All the managers got to go to Vegas. We didn't get to take our wives. We got to go to Las Vegas. New not New Mexico, Las Vegas, Nevada, Okay. <laughs> We got to go to Las Vegas, Nevada, all right? Now, now, I don't know. I was having a conversation with Stephanie on the phone, and I remember that she could hear the excitement in my voice, and I know she wasn't going on the trip, so I, was, I really wasn't trying to be excited, but I was really excited about going to Las Vegas. And so I'm telling her this, and I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of excited for this trip. I'm really looking forward to going on this trip. And she was like, 
Tell me exactly, pastor, what you think is good about going to Las Vegas. <laughs> T tell me, pastor, what, what are you so excited about in Las Vegas that I need to know about, you know? And I was like, look, here's the deal. I'm going to ride every ride on the top of the stratosphere. I've been looking at them all day on the internet. Like, I am ready to ride. They have roller coasters on the top of the stratosphere. It's like a space needle in the middle of the strip, right? And they have roller coasters on the top of it. And I'm like, babe, I'm going to go up in the sky, and I'm going to ride all these roller coasters, and I'm so excited about it. And she's like, good, 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 right? <laughs> But look, can I, I was excited about riding these roller coasters, so I did. I, so I want you to know, I went to Vegas, and I went straight up there, and I rode every single one of those roller coasters on top of that stratosphere. It was great. But do you know that two of them actually hang you off the side of the stratosphere? They, like, hang you off. Like, there's nothing between you and that parking lot way down there, okay? <laughs> it's like 1,164 feet, okay? That's like 11 stories, all right? And, and, the, and they do. It goes around, and then the, the other one, that, so two of them, like, hang you off, and there's nothing between you and the parking lot, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but when I was looking at the parking lot, I was thinking, is my will okay? Are my kids going to be all right? You know what I'm saying? Am I going to die today? Will I make a splat or a thud? Like, what, what's going to happen when I hit that part, which space of those spaces am I going to land in, right? Right, these are my thoughts when I'm in this position, okay? While I'm hanging out over there, I'm immediately thinking all these things. But you know what I did? I looked down inside the car or at the harness that they've got me strapped in with, right? And the buckle that's strapped in on top of that and the metal that I'm looking at that leads to the arm that goes to the thing. And when I look down at the strap, and the, and the thing, I realized, oh, it's just a ride, right? And this ride's probably going to last about three minutes, and then they're going to stick me back on, on the top of the stratosphere, and I'm going to get to go home, right? And I learned that lesson so strongly there that I told my kids any time we rode a roller coaster, hey, no matter what happens, it's not going to last longer than three minutes, and if you get lost, just look inside the car, right? Because when you start looking out what's out there, right, emotions start rising up inside of you, right? You start having emotions. I had a lot of emotions about things when I'm looking at the parking lot, right? But when I looked inside the car, all those emotions went away, and all I could see was security and the ability to, to make it through and what I needed to do to get through that moment. Sometimes when we're looking out, we have these emotions that come up in us. Now, I don't know if you know this, but if you look at the word emotions, it has a root word in it, and it's called motion. Because when we start feeling emotions, we start doing stuff, right? The reason you scream when you're over the side of the stratosphere is because you have an emotion inside you, and something comes out of you, right? So when we start looking out, right, then we have these emotions that start happening in us, we don't just get to envy and do nothing, right? That emotion of envy begins a motion in our life that we have to do something with. And so Paul says, to stop that motion, redirect your looking to look in. Start taking inventory of the car you're in. Start seeing the straps that you're in. Start looking at what's keeping you secure on this side of the fence, not what's not what's giving you anxiety on the other side of the fence, right? Start, start looking in so that you can make a different choice in that moment. Look, the book shares a couple of scenarios about people who are in different situations and how to deal with them differently. He shares this one scenario about a single woman. He says, a single woman withdraws from social life because she envies the marriages and families and friends, right? This woman is in her feelings, and she's reacting to her emotions by looking at other people's lives, and instead of positive motion, she's, she's withdrawing and breaking relationship so that she doesn't have to feel those emotions, right? He says, rather, what should happen is a single woman should begin to ask questions internally, like, I wonder why I never get asked out, or why I keep getting turned down for dates, right? I know it's not an easy question, but it's a question we have to ask. Or what's wrong, what's wrong with me that I'm, that I'm not doing well or I'm not communicating my intentions well to others? 
right? Am I going to the right places to even meet people? Am I in the right circles? How could I become a more of an interesting person, maybe? Or maybe how could I join a group, a therapy group, to either talk about it, or, or maybe I need to start looking at dating apps or different things. If this is my goal and intention, then I, we, we're going to move to a motion. The trick is which motion do we move to? Do we move to a, a negative one, right? Or do we move to one where we look inside and those emotions then drive us to more positive emotions? And we begin to look internally. So the question isn't, oh, well, they have, so I can't have, so I'm just going to be this. The question is, why, what can I do to get there, right? Look, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot harder to look inside. Can I be honest with you? Right? The shock and awe out there is easy to look at, right? It's a lot harder to decipher our emotions and our true feelings, right? But it is healthier, and it leads to more positive outcomes. Positive emotions, right? But when we withdraw we're channeling envy, right? Or when we feed into it, we're channeling envy. Boundaries law number eight simply is envy, and it says this. Envy is a self-perpetuating cycle. Again, it's internal. You start it, right? And then you restart it, and then you go deeper and you restart it, right? Envy is self-perpetuating. All it does is feed itself and keeps going around. And boundaryless people, if you don't put up boundaries, you already feel empty and unfulfilled inside. So then you have no choice but to react to that motion and look outside. Taking action is the only way out of this cycle. You have to begin to take action internally in your world and to do things, right? When we begin to recognize this natural emotion is common to man, remember it's Adam and Eve common, it's like first sin common, right? When we realize that this is common to man, that it's envy or coveting, then we can begin to make another move, right? Or ground ourselves in true reality we can start looking in and seeing the straps, not the parking lot, right? We can start, making it, we can start counting our blessings instead of that. And I love that the end of verse James 4, 2 says this. It says, you do not have because you do not ask God. James just doesn't leave us with, um, Paul's not just looking in like Paul. He says, you can ask God for anything. If you desire it, if that's your emotion, instead of looking just in, you may not need to look out, but you can look in and you can look up, right? You can take it to God and say, God, I, I'm really concerned with this. I'm asking this internal question of me, but God, I don't even understand me, but you made me, right? You created me in my mother's womb. You understand me. Help me to, help me to process this so that I can handle it in a healthy way, right? So if, if, if you get tired of looking in, start looking up. All right, this is how we do it. So Psalms 37, 4 says this, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know, someone once told me that the desires of your heart, God actually gave you those too, right? Those things that he placed inside you that you're driven to achieve and those things that you have done, he gave you that too. So he wants to be your partner in achieving it, right? Right? So if he gave it to you and he wants to be your partner in achieving it, then ask him to be your partner in getting from point A to point B. Rather than envy, we have to trust that the Lord, we have to trust the Lord for our provisions. Hallelujah. Right? Amen. Look, this will provide, God will provide the desires of our heart. That's what Paul says. It's the reason we don't have is because we're taking matters into our own hands and acting out instead of giving it to God and acting with him, right? God desires us to have what we need. You know, when you really chip your mind to that and you say, God really desires me, God, God is not out to harm you. He's not out to hurt you. He wants you to have the best life possible, Amen. right? He, he's always out for your good at all times. You may not think it's good at times, but he is, he's working something in your life that's going to work out for your good. And you have to believe that in your heart because it's really hard. If you think you have to go get it, if you, then that means you probably don't believe that. Right? Because it's hard to be content if you don't know God's got you covered. Right? So you have to shift your mentality and begin to understand that God really wants good for your life. He's not some evil ogre, mean guy trying to stop you at every angle, right? That guy has a name. He's called the devil, right? 
God is trying to help you in, in the process. And sometimes we get a glint in our eye for that thing on the other side. Then you have to think, God, did you give me that glint? God, how do we get there? How can I walk with you to get there? Because I don't want to break relationship with you. Adam and Eve could have had anything they wanted. Anything they wanted. They did. Right? And, they, and, they pro- and God put it inside of us to desire, to have ambition, to do these things. He put it inside of us. They had it too. All they had to do was keep walking with God. Tell the enemy to shut up and talk to God that night when they're walking with him in the garden, you know? There's a difference. They had options. So do we. So do we. So let's talk about our planks, right? Let's get back to our planks so we can put this in our wall and understand how it fits, right? So first plank, remember God, it's not really a first plank. God built the fence, right? Like God was like, hey, I'm going to dig a hole, buy some concrete. I'm going to plant this metal pole, not wood, right? This metal pole over here. And then I want you to put a... Then I want you to put a, a fence here. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you the boundary line. I'm going to give you a boundary line, right? And then you're going to build this fence along that line, right? Whatever you need. As a matter of fact, I'm going to supply the planks for you to put in there, right? And I'm going to tell you that they're going to work. They're like 100% foolproof. All you got to do is put it on the fence, get a nail, okay? This is what we're doing, right? So he says, okay. So God built that and says, this is what we're doing. So the second one is sowing and reaping. But he said, the first thing you got to understand is that don't be, God's not going to be mocked. A man will reap what he sows, right? A woman will reap what they sow. This is what's going to happen. So whatever you plant in the ground will come back to you in a harvest. That's what's going to happen, right? So that's your rule. This is how God uses it to teach us, right? We reap what we sow. And he uses it to teach the people on the other side of the fence the same thing. And when we step in front of their process, that's called enabling, right? If we stop them from reaping what they're sowing and we do it for them, that's enabling. If they do it for us, right? Your mama steps in your problem, right? That's called enabling too, right? Neither of them are okay because when we circumvent the process of a man will reap what he sows, we're missing what God is trying to teach us, okay? So that we can be better people. The other one is responsibility. The next one, so then we have responsibility, so responsibility, we learned some phrases. I am responsible for me, you're responsible for you. Remember that one? We learned that we, know, we are not responsible for the people on the other side of the fence. They are, they, are, they are amazingly smart beings sometimes who make their own decisions and do their own stuff, and God's teaching them through it, so we're not responsible for them, right? We are responsible for us. What's on this side of the fence, which is just you, we're responsible for that. We're responsible to them, like our children, our family, the church, whatever we're responsible to, right, but we're not responsible for, right? There's a difference, right? We can only be responsible for one person, and that's us. Then we have um, power. All of our relationships are power relationships, right? We, first, we have to acknowledge that we're involved in a power relationship, no matter which one it is, right? Jesus, we love Jesus. He's our best relationship. He has all the power. We don't have any, right? So there's a power relationship involved, even in our most perfect relationships, so all of our relationships have a power dynamics. We have to first acknowledge it. Then we got to say, okay, well, where, do, where can we exercise power, right? You know where we can exercise power? On our side of the fence. Everybody else on that side of the fence, we cannot control them. There is no control. There's influence. There's ability. They can see our lives. They can ask questions. But ultimately, they make all their decisions on their own, right? Have you ever tried to make a person do something or carry a person somewhere? That's hard, right? You cannot do that, right? They can do it only on their own. Then we have respect, right? We didn't get to put that one in our fence, remember? We did not get to put it in our fence. They put it in our fence because we gave them like four and we were like, you will respect my boundary, right? You will do it. And then they were like, well, you're going to respect this one. And we're like, no, 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 wait a second. Hold on. Maybe we don't want that in our fence, right? So we put this respect here, right? R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Find out what it means to me. It means that we're going to respect their boundaries and they're going to respect our boundaries, right? And then we have motivation, right? And our motivation is a heart of gratitude. Similar to what we're kind of talking about today, we get to look in our own yard and we get to be like, man, God, thank you for doing this. You are so great because of that, Lord, and because of the safety and security that you're giving me with my boundary that I can still dip back here, right? And I can still see through and I can still talk over and I can still be in relationship. You're providing that, Lord. And so now I'm going to, with a heart of gratitude, I'm going to express that, and I'm going to realize, you know, going on to the next one of evaluation, that with that heart of gratitude, not only is that why I'm maintaining the boundary, but I'm also understanding that the other person may not have what I have, right, or may be in a different place, and I have to realize that my boundary is affecting others' lives 
as well. It doesn't mean I don't do it. It means that I know I'm affecting them. So when they, when they react to me, I'm not reacting in anger. I'm just saying, I get it. This is still the boundary, right? You know, I understand you're going to act that way. I understand you're going to do those things, right? And so we have that evaluation moment. We're doing that. And we're blessed to be a blessing, right? We get the safety and security of our, of our fence so that we can be a blessing to others. And then last week we talked about proactivity, right? From there we're kind of building here, right? Because we want to be, because we understand what reactivity is, right? Someone puts a boundary in our life, we're going to tell them, right? We're going we're gonna to express our opinions. We're going to plan our boundary with some gusto. Some of these planks went in like fiercely, you know what I'm saying? And we have these reactions, but that's not where we're supposed to live. We're supposed to be proactive in our approach to it, right? We're supposed to be setting boundaries and knowing what it's going to happen on the other side, taking everything we've learned so far and actively moving proactively and setting our boundaries. And then today, so we went all this way, and now we're going to put up envy, right? So envy, interestingly enough, injury, envy we don't put up as a boundary for you. We're not, we're not putting this up so that you can treat us right. We're putting this up so that we treat us right. I think of envy like a big stop sign, right? We're moving along our boundaries, and then we have the ability to where we start thinking, you know, oh, well, now, now that I'm in a safe place, right? Because now that we've handled these little petty, petty things in relationship, now we want more, right? And so this is like a stop sign where we get to say, oh, maybe I should stop just a second and realize, count what I have, right? I can't be grabby, grabby on the other side. This is like, oh, I'm, I'm looking through the fence in your yard and I'm liking that, right? But I'm not taking down my fence to go get it, right? Because this is a stop sign that tells me, that's not my job, right? I'm not supposed to be envying in that way. So I have to stop that and realize where I'm at. So we have our, our fences growing. We're getting this on there, right? But look, we can choose, and, and realizing the thing is we can choose to ask God for the things that we want, that we need to be content. We can go to him. We can look up and we can go to him and ask him, right? And, and we, then once we understand, if we understand that God wants our best for us and that we can go to ask him, then we can take his reply and be content. We can realize that whatever he's given us, he's given us to be content with, right? And we can say, okay, God, I've asked you for it. It hasn't come yet, but I know that you want what's best for my life, right? We can say that already. We can be content with what that has because he has our best interests in mind. Look, I'm sure you've heard it said the grass is always greener on the other side, right? It's always there. Right? We can always look out and find something that we desire or that we want. How are we handling it, though? Right? Is that something God put in our heart? Or is that something that we are, we're stepping out in envy or covetousness? Right? All right, so look, when I lived in Fort Worth, we had this neighborhood. It was a relatively small neighborhood. It was like two streets. It was really, they were just growing. They were still building. But they had this thing called Yard of the Month. Right? Okay? And so... Since it was such a small neighborhood and I actually like my yard, right, I'm like, I'm going to win this, right? And we lived there for a, for a year, and I want you to know I never won Yard of the Month. Not one time, right? I'm a little, I'm a little bitter. It's okay. No. I did good with my yard, and I did great with my yard. But you know who won? Man, there were people who did incredible landscaping things in their yard. Because I noticed. I noticed every month. I drove by their house, right, to see why they won. Right? They, did, they did nice yard landscaping things. They did, they, their Christmas decorations were over the top. I don't know how much they spent on them, but they just did great things every month to win Yard of the Month, and I didn't. Right? I know I didn't. I didn't put it forth that effort to really go out there and get Yard of the Month. Now, don't get me wrong. I had a nice yard, and I liked it. Right? But you know what? Just because they won Yard of the Month and I didn't, didn't mean that I didn't have a good yard didn't mean that my house wasn't nice. Didn't mean that my family wasn't secure. Didn't mean that we did, we, our cupboards had food in them, right? Didn't mean none of that, that something was off. Nothing was off because I didn't win Yard of the Month. My yard still was nice. I was very proud of my yard, right? And I had much to be proud of. I probably didn't have the time others did or do other things, but, but we had a good house. And you know the funniest thing is that winning Yard of the Month does not increase the value of your home. Did you know that? Your home is primarily valued by its location, right? But it doesn't, your house, their house is not worth any more than your house. Their family may or may not be in a better position than yours. Probably not, right? But ultimately, you know, 
winning Yard of the Month was not the goal. If the Lord wanted me to have Yard of the Month, then he would have. But you know what? He gave me a nice yard and a nice house and good things. And I had a lot to be happy for and have pride over, right? God knows my heart. There are times, certainly, when I find myself looking outward at another's life, at their marriage, at their kids, their upbringing, or, or their financial situation. Look, and I've had the thought that maybe I was dealt a bad hand at times, or maybe I just started at a, at a lower level, right, than they did. And, and I have those thoughts, right? We all do, right? We can all get lost in this. But what Paul encourages us to do is to take it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord. Ask him. Listen for his answer. Be proactive and pray to God with a thankful heart for what you already have. Look in your yard and and have gratitude for the things that we've given. And then just ask God. Be proactive in asking him. Ask him to give you the desire of your heart. And if the desire that you think you have in your heart, it, it, he says no to, ask him to give you one that he says yes to. Right? So that you can find that peace and contentment. Because remember, covetousness, relationship killer. It broke the first and only relationship between God and man. Right? It will break every one of your relationships. If you don't stick this boundary up, this thing up, you can do all of that other stuff and you're going to get to this one and you're just going to break your relationship doesn't matter how secure you feel behind it. As long as you're still envying or covenanting, you're breaking relationships. So we have to put it up, right? The envy boundary is a personal boundary. It's for you. Not so much for them, because you can't control them or stop them from envying or wanting anyway, right? We don't have that power, right? But we do have the power over us. We can put it as a personal boundary. We don't set it against them. Look, the fence line, remember the fence line between us and them? Our side, we get to trust and learn and rely on God more and more, right? This is what we're trying to do. Letting God know, hey, God, you know where my yard is. You know where my lines are. You're going to build the best life possible for me, Lord. How do I join your forces with you? And we built enough fence to know that we find safety and security in the yard. Even if you've only been able to put up a couple of these in your life, you already feel the security that it's providing, right? So we now know, hey, this is the way we want to go. We can't start with stopping envy. We really can't, right? We wouldn't have the right heart. We wouldn't be at gratitude. We wouldn't be proactive. We wouldn't have the steps we needed to get here. But if we, if we don't put this one here, we won't get to the next step because we're going to throw it all away over and over again. It's a self-perpetuating cycle, right? That's going to lead us back to where we are. And when we put it up, just take that moment. It's taking a beat. gives you time to meditate, think, and rely on God, and to look up, and to look in, right? Not be looking at the parking lot. Parking lot's going to cause some stuff to stir, okay? Right? But if you look in, you'll feel them reside. If you look up, you'll find your potential, right? So we can do those things, okay? Look, let me pray for some groups today. I want to pray for, um, first group I want to pray for is some of you are living in a state of comparison, Some of you were checking Instagram during my sermon. You know what I mean? Some of you are looking at someone else's picture, doing something that, you know, this morning, last night, you've already set out a life plan to become Elon Musk. You know what I'm saying? You've already got it. So I want to pray today for those of you who are living in this state of comparison. I want to pray that you'll begin to look inside and see what you have. That you'll really start taking stock and counting your blessings and seeing what the Lord is doing in your life. And see, and because that's what's holding you Man, what's inside, what's on this side of the wall, our boundaries that we put, this is what's keeping us from falling into destruction, right? We have this barrier here, so we need to look inside our yard. The second thing is some of you are allowing your emotions to drive your motion. And that motion is causing problems in relationships, right? And so we need to look at those things and we need to say, Lord, Lord, I want to learn and I want to learn how to pray rather than act. I want to learn how to Look in rather than act out, right? And I want to learn how to do those things. So I'm going to pray that you can do that. And lastly, some of you heard for the first time that God loves you and that he only wants good for you. Like that's a foreign concept to you, right? You've, maybe, you've, maybe God's been given as a, as a mean God, as a, 
as a as a rule 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 putter God or as a a fence in God, not a fence out God, or whatever you have, right? Whatever your mindset is that God is this ogre and this mean person who who because you're a sinner, you know, is after you. But today I want you to, you need to shift that mentality and understand, hey, God is always for you. He only wants the best for you. By you taking your concerns to him, he can he can change things. By you aligning with what he has for your life, that's where stuff really gets moving in your life. So if you thought God was a mean ogre, today's your day to make a different call, to see him in a different light, to ask him to come into your heart and ask him to come into your mind and change things. Whether that's dedication, rededication, or, or salvation, I want to pray for that too. So let me pray for you today. Lord, I love you so much. God, I just thank you that you have gave us your word and that you You've helped us to establish these boundaries in our lives, Lord. You've given us a, a new lease on life and a, a new way to understand your life, Lord. And you're breaking free, breaking, breaking relationship curses, generational curses in our life, Lord, with new information. And we just thank you. Lord, today I want to pray for those who are living in a state of comparison. Lord, everywhere they look, all they see is what they don't have. Lord, today I pray that you would show them what they have, Lord. Give them a slideshow and a and a vision, Lord, of all the great things that are in their life, Lord, that they can see it and understand what you are doing. Lord, I also want to pray for the group who's taking their emotions and turning them into motion. Lord, they're, they're hanging off of the cliff, looking down, and, and they're reacting in fear, reacting in anger. Lord, they're, they're moving in an emotion, an emotion that's not healthy for relationships today. It's causing problems. Lord, I want to pray today that they learn how to look in and look up. Lord, I thank you for your word that you says we can take it to you in prayer. Lord, we can ask you to do things and change and move things. Lastly, Lord, some today heard for the first time that, God, that you have our best interests at heart. Wow, God. To know that you're always going to be looking out for what's best for me. God, that may have not been the God I grew up with. It may have been not been the God I, I thought I've seen in other areas. I may be believing, believing lies of the enemy or lies of other people, Lord, that tell me that you're mean and you're restrictive. Lord, today I learned that you are out for my best interest at all times. And because of that, Lord, I want to recommit to you. I want to offer my life to you wholeheartedly. Lord, I want to. I want to go. Go. I want to ask you to save my soul. Lord, I want to pray with these people today. Those who have this need in their life. Lord, I'll pray with them. Lord, I've been a terrible manager of my life. God, I've been doing it my way for so long. I don't even know how to do it any different. Lord, today, I need you to come into my heart and begin to change things. Lord, I don't want to break relationship with you. Break relationship with people in my life based on desires that aren't even real for my life. Lord, today I submit my life into your hands. I ask you to come into my heart and change things. Change me from the inside out. Help me to look inside, Lord, and make, make the differences that I need to. Help me to look up at the times when I feel like reacting. Lord, today I believe that you're the Son of God. That you came to this earth and you walked among us. Lord, you died on the cross and you were buried, but on the third day you rose again. Lord, you ascended it, you ascended to heaven and the, to sit at the right hand of the Father, and you're coming back for a church that's called by your name. Today, Lord, I want to be in that number. God, today I ask you to lead, guide, and direct me all the days of my life. Lord, be my Savior. Lord, I love you so much. Lord, I want to pray for our church today. Lord, that as we begin to put up boundaries in our lives, Lord, that we are no longer boundaries. Lord, but that others will see a difference in us. And they'll ask questions, Lord, or they'll help us. We can help them, but more so, Lord, we can lead them to you. Help us to always express that you're the, the heart of what we're doing. You're the, you're the purpose for our lives. You're our mission that we're on. Lord, today, help us to be a beacon of light for those who need you the most. Help us to break these generational lines that are set in this city, Lord, with new boundaries that you provided for us. Help us to walk in your ways. Lord, I love you and I thank you.
It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you guys stand with me one more time? I'm going to ask the prayer teams if they'll come forward. As we go into the last song and one more song here, if you have a prayer need, if you want someone to pray with you about this recommitment or rededication, or maybe you just need healing or you need, you need a touch from God, you need a word from God, any of that today, I want you to come forward and let our prayer team with you pray during this song. All right?